Hello, I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. My guest today is Chris Richardson, CEO of Percival Software, one of the leading suppliers of technology to central securities depositories, or CSDs. And it's CSDs that are the subject of our conversation today, what they need, what they want, what they worry about as their businesses evolve in an era of ever greater digitization. Chris, thanks for joining us. You're welcome, Dominic. We're happy to be here. Should be an interesting discussion, I think. Well, I hope so. And uh, certainly you've done some interesting things. Uh, in fact, one of them is what I'd like to bring up straight away. You've launched a new trading platform called yeah. Revenue, which takes Percival and thereby its clients into the trading area for the yeah. first time. Now, to what extent yeah. were you responding with that to, to client demands or to your competitors? Uh, and, and what does it cover? This Does it cover everything? Issuing, trading, settlement and custody? No, it, 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 it's specifically about trading and it, and it wasn't directly a response to, to customer requirements. It, it, in a way, it was. I mean, th one of the issues we have is that um, the big the big tender tenders and, and projects that come up for computerization of a, of a stock exchange, um, th they tend to be looking for a vendor that can supply both a, a trading system and a CSD at the same time. And some 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 very rare cases also CCP, but. That, that, that's much less common. And uh, they tend to look for single vendors that can do both. So in order for me to compete in such a project uh, without a trading platform, I would have to partner with a credible trading system vendor in order to, to, to win the project. And pretty well all the competitors who would, would make sense would be attractive to, to a, you know, a prospect, a customer going through the process. Uh, they're trying to build CSDs, so no, I, I, I can't do it. So I felt we felt limited actually for pretty well a decade already that you know we need to do something about this, and, and eventually we did. We developed the, the, the product, mm -hmm. and it, and it doesn't cover everything. It literally is 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 just trading, but it's got our our, our slant on it, our, our our mark on it in in terms of flexibility and and, and configurability that that. Uh, all the lessons we learned about, you know, a, a major capital market solution that, that uh, we bring to the table with our, our CSD solution. We Sorry, Chris, I, I, I put that rather badly. I, I, ah. with your, together with your with revenue, with your existing products, you can cover the issuance, yes. the settlement, uh, the custody, assets, and the trading. Now you've got a complete yes. front to back, end to end set of platforms, right? Yes, um, yes. So we don't have a CCP. That's, a, that's the next fruit that we're, we're looking at, but um, uh, that, that'll be a little while yet. <laughs> the trading system settled down first. Yeah. And there, there, there are plenty of opportunities for it, but yeah, that's right. From, from issuance through to secondary market, trading, corporate actions, the full, full range of things that you might want. Okay. Now, you, you've begun to touch on this, but and you see these vertically integrated financial market input markets as well as... Um, all sorts of other markets, including very small emerging ones. What in 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 the, the sort of um, markets you're selling into? What type of financial market infrastructure is actually looking for this front to back solution? Can you characterize it at all, or is it always kind of? It's, no, it's well. Okay, the the CSDs okay. Fall, fall into two categories. There's either the, the main capital market CSD or a central bank. And central banks tend not to be looking at uh, secondary market solutions like a, a trading system. But the, the typical customer is, uh, you know, your classic stock exchange, not, not the modern digital exchange or currency exchange or anything like that. Specifically, the traditional uh, capital market exchanges around the world, one per country usually. And, and they tend to be silos. So it's a single organization or group of owners, participants, call them what you may. Uh, they run the exchange, they, they own the CSD, and if there's a CCP in place as well, they, they're, they're running that too. It, it's, it, it's referred to as a silo configuration, so yeah. Now, one thing we do see at Future of Finance is a, is a class of, of software vendor who is offering front to back end-to-end -end solutions using blockchain technology. That seems to be the model which they've inherited from the cryptocurrency exchanges. Is that, by which I mean blockchain, 
uh, or DLT, if you prefer. Is that, are you tempted to compete in that market? Yes, but not, not just so. I mean, it's not clear what we would have to offer if, if we would just develop a completely self-standing uh, solution to do that. And, and, and we try and be driven by practical use cases of, of how that might be implemented. And, and one of the difficulties we have is that a lot of exchanges might say, oh, okay, let, let, let's implement something that's blockchain or digital, digital you know, distributed ledger technology, whatever it happens to be. It's a big buzzword for them and a few of them actually understand it. They, they, they don't know what it, they're actually asking for. It, interestingly, a lot of, a lot of those uh, traditional exchanges, particularly emerging, small emerging markets, are still using uh, an archaic method of risk mitigation called pre-validation. So um, blockchain is a little bit different. It, it doesn't work, but it doesn't sit or work particularly well with that. I mean, in, in di digital exchanges, they tend to pre-fund on both sides. It, it, the model doesn't match what they do traditionally. So unless they were to go through a complete sea change, when I start explaining this is how it might work, and these are the problems that you will you will encounter if you for example, just want to move settlement onto the chain. Uh, it gives them pause for thought. So I haven't had any, any, kind of, any kind of customers with a definite firm idea that said, yes, let's go with this, let's do that, or let's start a project to understand how we might implement it in our market. No, such a prospect has not yet arisen. Are we looking for it? Yes, we're, we're quite keen to do it. It's not, it's not rocket science. Huh? But um, the, the, the business side of it, the model, implementing that successfully is, is not so straightforward. Now, since you, you, you've raised the subject of, of pre-validation, perhaps we can explore it a bit further. I noticed you'd, you'd recently published a paper which, which criticised the practice of, of pre-validation, by which we mean, uh, as I think you've indicated, that the reserving of, of securities in a seller's account to ensure the sales order is going to be fulfilled. Um, and you're obviously seeing that in, in the markets which you which you serve. And your white paper says that's unfair uh, in the sense the buyer keeps the cash while the seller doesn't um, doesn't have to give up the uh, doesn't enjoy the equivalent use of the securities. You, you said it's liable to be misrepresented by the consultants that that uh, um, uh, play a, a large role in in um, explaining to custodian banks what the risks are of, of dealing with with CSDs. You said it. It's a very harsh paper in many ways. You said it inhibits market development. Yeah, it does. Um, you don't need it in markets which have CCPs. You know, it creates operational risk. Well, there's no, but there is no actual risk in a spot market because mm -hmm. if a trade fails, the buyer still has his money, the seller still has his cash. Mm -hmm. where, where, where's the risk? It's not risk as you would understand it. The sort of risk that a, a CCP manages when they have to deal with. You know more complex instruments, asset types like you know the options and futures and things of that nature, where well, there's mark to market and leverage involved, and, and and if you make a bad deal, uh, you're going to lose a shirt on your back. So uh, managing risk for, for those kind of uh, trading those kind of assets is is really important, but for spot markets, no, not not really needed, and it, it is unfair. It, it doesn't treat the buyer and the seller the same and that, that's not right you know if i'm buying only a hundred or a thousand euros or ten thousand euros worth of something it, it, it's minimal but some markets you know particularly fixed income we're talking about millions changing hands tens of millions hundreds of millions so treating them differently then it's a big thing and if it's good for the guys at that level then you should extend the same courtesy to small investors too. So people should be treated equitably on both sides of the of the deal. There is a settlement risk, and and pre-validation is a pretty straightforward way of, of mitigating that risk. It kind of fits with the way that the European Union has been arguing, I suppose, with the settlement discipline regime of, of the CSDR. You know, there is if you, if you know well if you're saying that a seller has to reserve what they've sold rather than be free to sell it to somebody else or rehypothecated up the wazoo, or whatever it is they're going to do, you you could argue that that actually you are arguing against the spirit of the times in Europe. No, at least, no, right? no not at all. No, no, Europe is not like that. I mean, first of all, DVP is at, at the participant level, not at the individual level, and 
that participant decides on his relationship and the credit rating of his customer, whether he wants to set those or earmark those, those securities. And some countries have um, trading mechanism models, which means that for a seller, in any case, I need to transfer my securities to the broker's account. And if I'm a buyer, I need to deposit the cash up front. So in practice, they tend to get around it. But the CSDR requirements uh, and the settlement discipline require those securities or, or ask for those securities to be frozen for the minimum amount of time as possible. We're talking seconds. And in those developed markets, there isn't this panic about a trade failing. If a trade fails, it gets recycled on, on, on the developed market, but sorry, on a regulated market. In the Baltic, for example, I can speak more authoritatively about that. Um, if a trade fails on the regulated market, it gets recycled for up to 20 days. Um, that's it, after which it's just canceled. And, and the exchanges are not afraid that a failing trade will affect their reputation as an exchange. It clearly doesn't. Um, and, 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 but it seems to be a little bit different for the, 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 the smaller markets. If you only have a, you know, a thousand trades a day and you have 5% of them trading because oh, I don't know, the market's not safe, but I don't agree with you. There isn't a risk. There's a, what, what settlement risk is there? You're not, they're both treated equitably. If, I, if, if the trade fails, I still have my securities. I can go and sell them again. I still have my cash. I can, you know, I can go and buy something else. It, 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 really, the risk is not serious or, or even worth considering. It's not not at the level of trading derivatives. Not, right. not so, the same thing. Yeah. so your argument, in essence, is that is that if uh, the cash buyer and the security seller were treated equitably, in other words, <clears throat> the seller could keep his do what he likes with his securities, and the buyer could do what he likes with his cash. Um, that the problem kind of goes away. In fact, they're creating a problem with with pre validation rather than solving one. Yeah, because, I mean, if you think about a repurchase transaction, the, if you can buy a sell back or sell and buy back, um, it's basically two DVP transactions. So one at the opening leg, one at the closing leg. If the closing leg means that uh, the securities that come back already have to be cleared, you can't do anything with them in, in the meantime. So a lot of more complex uh, capital market products are built on the understanding that uh, you're not going to be pre-validating securities. Now, you, you touched on on the question of the CCP, which is, of course, is another way of of, of kind of dealing with this with this problem, yeah. as is stock lending and and borrowing. Yep. So, in fact, one of the points you make in this paper is it's unnecessary to have pre-validation in markets where you have a CCP because that's um, covering the net risk. Uh, of, yeah. of the sort of, anyway, so yeah. but is building CCPs, having stock lending facilities, a realistic proposition in the in the kind of markets you're talking about building a ccp is not really indicated but okay the standard says that the use of a ccp is recommended and people never read the rest of the sentence which says in the case of otc traded derivatives ccp is recommended now once you have a ccp in existence at all it should be applied uniformly to the entire market so even the equity Trading comes into the same uh, under the same aegis as the as a CCP and under the derivatives. Um, so um, yeah, it's it's not indicated. Stock lending and borrowing, however, that's different. Stock lending and borrowing have been in the G thirty recommendations since they were first published in nineteen eighty nine. They've been around a lot for a long time. So they're not the same thing at all. So yeah, and not and interestingly, not many markets have implemented them. And, and again, with stock lending and borrowing, it, it tends to conflict. The actual practical way in which they are implemented tends to conflict a little bit with uh, with pre-validation. So yeah. Now, if I look back a few minutes, what what prompted your observations about pre-validation was was actually an initial discussion around around blockchain, and ironically um, enough, blockchain. It's based, yeah, it's based upon this atomic settlement. So both the cash and the security side have to be uh, yeah. pre-funded. Uh, and if, if, if neither is, is in the account at the time or, or the, the wallet at the time the trade needs to settle, uh, the, the, the transaction simply dies. Um, yeah. So you, you, you could argue that, that blockchain, this great um, uh, future technology with its atomic settlement, actually requires uh, lending of cash and stock if it's too... 
um, if it's to work. Yeah, go figure. We can have a philosophical discussion about that even because the, the, the cultures are, are so fundamentally different. Um, in most digital exchanges that, that, that I have come across, they seem to be focused on direct access by the investor and who trusts them. You know, that they are, even in cases where they're not anonymous, they're not being credit checked, they're not, no, nothing like that exists. So the safest way to handle it clearly is to make sure they deposit funds if they want to buy and block their securities if they're trying to sell. There is no argument about that. Mm -hmm. But the classic markets, and this is probably somewhere where we, where we disagree most, and, 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 and um, it's about the value of the, the classic exchanges and, and the structure of capital markets were, were set up to build this kind of regulated um, layer in the middle that tried to protect the investor from, well, um, disaster. So the broker is there to make sure he doesn't make unwise decisions and give him advice. And um, the, the exchange and the regulators are there to make sure that nothing nothing gets put up unless it has, has proper, proper, uh, proper disclosure. Um, in order to be listed, even half listings have a lower level of disclosure, but a full listing on a, a reputable exchange has got to jump through quite, quite a lot of ho hoops to get listed. So yeah, it, it's a completely different way of looking at uh, the, the environment of trading. Uh, they're, they're both right, but they're, they're for different things. <laughs> I guess atomic settlement does at least is equitable, unlike the, the situation yeah. you, you're describing in your white paper. Yeah. Both the, you know, the buyer has to have the cash in the account and the seller has to have the securities in the account. So it is at least not unfair, even if it is potentially expensive to operate. Yeah, yeah well, it, it's also trade by trade. So you need higher liquidity. You can't play off, you can't play off a, a sale against a, a, an expected incoming purchase or vice versa, depending on which side you were on. Now, talking of settlement, I, I brought up blockchain, you brought up a, a few minutes ago, central banks. So this, this brings me to the question of central bank digital currencies. Settlement obviously normally takes place in central bank money. Central banks also operate in most markets, the, the RTGS um, final settlement system between, between banks. Sometimes, of course, they operate the CSD as well, TGS in Europe being an an obvious example of that, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but but CBDCs could put, um, you know, fiat currency, central bank money, onto these uh, blockchain networks. To to what extent are you talking to central banks, or are central banks talking to you um, a, about how that central bank money on ledger or on chain is going to work for CSDs? No. <laughs> They're not, mm -hmm. and they- Is, Are you trying all, to talk to them? Yeah, mm -hmm. almost every day, Dominic. It, it, right. It's very difficult to, to reach out to central banks because of, of, well, the kind of organization they are. I mean, a, a lot of them, and <laughs> I'm not pointing any specific fingers, but they have such a, a protected position, um, not just in regulation, but politically, it's seen as, Mm -hmm. A really bad thing when a government starts fiddling around in central bank and trying to control fiscal policy itself. A lot of reasons why the re regulations and, and, and the practice surrounding central banks tries to, to, to keep hands off from the government. So th they tend to be very self-driven and independent in their thinking. Um, in terms of the vendors they deal with, they're not likely to buy anything from a vendor who doesn't have an existing central bank on in their portfolio so and we don't we don't have any central banks of customers yet uh in a couple of markets that we serve um and there are more developed markets the central bank has outsourced the the csd work for their their you know for government bonds and treasury bills and things like that to to, to, to just this one single central securities depository so it's not that we don't our product can't handle it it's just we don't have any central banks directly as customers, and that affects us quite quite badly when we're competing in, in a central bank tender. So it's it's, it's it's eluded us for the so far, but we continue to try. 
And to go back to your question about uh, their, their fiat currencies and central bank digital currencies, um, they, they're not working with any consideration for, for uh, CSDs, I think, in that, or capital markets in general. I think their, their, their aims and goals are a little bit more populist, trying to, to cash in on the, you know, the, the sudden interest in digital currencies and, uh, and things like that. And if there's going to be a digital currency, central bank would rather be in, in control of it rather than have something like... Um, Ethereum or, or Bitcoin, which is, doesn't answer, answer to anyone. And, and, and a country wants to have control over its fiscal policy, and it can't do that without its own digital currency. So I don't think that conflict is going to end anytime soon. The, the countries are not just not willing to, to, to let it happen. And on the smaller end of the scale, you've got countries, sm smaller countries, emerging markets worried about uh, exchange control. Not everyone's got con convertible currencies, and, and uh, there are disadvantages that, that go along with that. So, uh, I, I have no idea what the central banks are putting in place at that smaller end of the market when it comes to, to foreign exchange control. But I know, you know, that I have quite a few customers in the Caribbean, for example, and um, in every single country, there there are exchange controls. We, we know because we're you know we we need to get invoices paid. So. Um, it's not, not so straightforward. The, the last thing they want is a peer-to-peer -peer network to transfer funds in and out of the country willy-nilly. That's not, that's not what the central bank digital currencies are about at the smaller end of the market. So I don't know. We're, we're watching it with interest to see how it develops. But yeah. I mean, exchange controls, I, I guess, are one reason that in, in some of these markets are banning cryptocurrencies. But you've yeah. just brought up you just brought up the question of the Caribbean. Obviously, you know, the, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is one which has actually issued a a, a CBDC. I've been I've been quite surprised by by what you've said. Is it okay. simply is it is it simply that um, the the central banks have forgotten that securities transactions have a have a cash leg? They've been so focused on the payments side of things that they've forgotten actually that securities have to be paid for as well. Or are they just thought that's I don't I can't answer you. I I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that direct discussions between the, the, an exchange or a CSD and, and their local central bank are, are, are not, mm -hmm. not ha happy, pleasant parties there. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, here in Europe, we've actually seen one CSD, new startup CSD, which is based on blockchain technology. I'm referring to ID2S, mm -hmm. uh, which closed its doors in the autumn of, of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and among the reasons that it closed, of course, was was of course central bank monetary policy, which kind of destroyed the market they were trying to operate in, the commercial paper market. Yep. Um, but also they weren't particularly helpful in, in helping ID2S to, to thrive no. by, by imposing you know, competition obligations on, on the incumbents there. So it is rather difficult to see what, what, quite what central banks are, are really thinking about CSDs and what they're actually seeking from CSDs, because it's clearly a very important aspect of introducing a... A CBDC, it could transform the market in a very substantial way. Of course, so, it, is. Of course it is. Of course it is. There's no argument about that. But I mean, I don't have kind words to say about the service that central banks offer. I mean, that, that, you know, huh. I, 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 I'm not competent to judge how they perform on fiscal policy. That's not my domain expertise. Okay. Mm -hmm. But as a bank user, I mean, okay. I, I, I have a bank in the uh, a bank account in the UK, and I can log on to that internet bank. And as long as I'm moving funds to, to another account within the same bank, I get 24/7 service, and it's inter instantaneous. I can enter a transaction anytime during the day, and it's just immediately updated in, in, on the account level. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you take a step back and you look at it from a central bank point of view, and we're talking about moving money between commercial banks, the commercial banks in the country are just like clients of a larger bank, a central bank, and to move money between one commercial bank and another um, within the central bank's banking system should be like that. So you think, why are CSDs suffering? I mean, what does a CSD need in order to operate a, a good service to its customers? It needs to be able to be able to transfer funds from one participant to the, to the other throughout the operational day. But they can't even seem to do that. So uh, what they're being offered is 
one settlement batch per day, two, two or three settlement batches. It doesn't matter. I mean, when we went live in Estonia with our Depend product, it was at the same time they swapped over to the EU at the end of 2010, even 2011. We were running settlement batches every 30 minutes throughout the operational day from eight o'clock in the morning till six in the evening. For whatever reasons that, that, that only a central bank can explain to you, that they stop um, DDP at four o'clock because they have to call the end of day, run the end of day processes, whatever the reasons for that are, are, I don't know, I can't judge. But then basically what happens is that you could still, you know, we, we still continue to settle FOPs settled or DVPs where um, the buyer and the seller use the same, same cash agent. So, and, and we could have compressed that down. It didn't have to be 30 minutes. It was just that worked particularly well for that market, but it, it can be five minutes, two minutes. It can be you know, 15 minutes. And, and there's no reason why a central bank can't do that, but where is that happening? That, that very few places would, would do that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, a, it's a normal standard service you would expect from a bank. And central banks seem to have difficulty in, in, in providing that to mm -hmm. a customer like a CSD. Sorry, that, that's what I see where I'm sitting. Oh, so definitely room for improvement in the way in which central banks yeah. uh, interoperate and interact with, with CSDs. But perhaps we could move on and talk about another um, mega trend which is going to affect CSDs, which is, which is data. Mm -hmm. Clearly, CSDs both absorb and produce data. And like everybody else in that position, they uh, face a potential conflict between um, realizing value from that data and respecting the privacy of the people who who own that um, that data. So I'm I'm in Europe here, particularly. You operate on a global scale, but you also operate in Europe. We have this data protection legislation called GDPR. That's gradually seems to be becoming the global model for, for people, um, if not exactly a global standard. So in, in what ways do you see the CSDs that you, um, that you have as, as customers and talk to as potential customers? How are they thinking about data? Are they looking to exploit its value? What are the challenges they see in doing that if they are? They're not allowed to. On the CSDR, GDPR, they are not allowed to. The, 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 the data doesn't have value to CSDs. They can't use that. Not like a stock exchange, they can sell market data. But CSD is not allowed to sell that kind of information. And that, that said, quite a lot of CSDs would want to publish statistics about you know, things being settled and, and, and things like that, and the number of transactions processed. And, and, and to that extent, they can do, do it. But it's not, not about making money. It's just, just about you know, good public relations and allowing you to, to do analysis and stuff like that. But they themselves don't sell it, as, as far as I can tell. And, and in Europe, GDPR has been, for us, um, not a, well, for our relationship with our customers in respect of giving them support has been an unmitigated disaster. So in the past, um, something went wrong and we were called in to do it, give a little bit of support. And we said, well, can we have a look at it? And, and, and we could log into the system or at least a copy of the system. It didn't have to be production in some cases because it wasn't so time sensitive. It, it, it's a, a kind of problem we're looking at. We could get a copy of the data. We could look at it on, online, you know, connect remotely to them. Um, these days, no, ever since GDPR come in, because GDPR uh, says that you can, in theory, for every transgression, be fined up to 25% of your turnover, your annual turnover. So no one wants to risk that. And it, it, it doesn't matter what the practice is and how urgent the need is. Um, when, when you get to a certain size, your corporate lawyers look at it and say, this is not worth taking the risk. So I don't care that we need support from you. You are not going to be able to look at our data. Unless, of course, you want to take on the burden of being defined as a data processor, which we will not. Because again, it, that just dumps that 25% <laughs> fine on us. We can't afford to pay that. I'm sorry. It's, it's just ridiculous. So it, it, it's hard as a, as a solution vendor to be able to give good quality support under the current terms of GDPR as, as it's being implemented within Europe. And, and I understand why, but it's just, it, it, it's a little bit crazy. 
I mean, the, the other conflict with, with, that I see with GDPR is, is that, again, I, I can speak more confidently about UK law. And as a result, uh, the laws of, of Commonwealth countries or ex-Commonwealth countries, which um, th there's quite a lot of, of, of base material there in that, that, that came out of uh, you know, uh, Cat 48, the uh, British company law. So it, it's, it's fundamental concepts are, are the same. So there's a certain um, element of public access to a register. Now, in, in Europe, it, it, companies struggle to find out who their shareholders are from time, you know, from one second to the next, and, and things move swiftly in the more developing markets. Whereas in, in, in the UK, name on register environments, essentially, um, you could, in theory, allow an issuer access to their register. Whether or not issuers are, themselves are allowed to exploit that data, data is a little bit fuzzy on the GDPR, but the, the, a lot of them don't want to take the risk either. But you, know, you, you can understand to a certain extent there's a little bit of overlap. So a big telecoms company, a lot of the shareholders will be customers and they'd want to be able to reach out to those. But the opportunity is to do that for, for those large uh, th those institutions and companies with large registers of shareholders um, is becoming ever more severely restricted. It, it, it's really, it, it, it puts a cramp on what you can do with the data. So no good news there, I'm afraid, Dominic. Well, the register is quite a good example of yep. a, an area which where CSTs could help to develop the so-called data economy. And if yeah. they're not willing to take the risk to be a data processor, and nor are you willing to take the risk of being a data processor on their behalf, this is clearly making it more difficult for them to develop their businesses in that sort it's of not, It's direction. not our job. It's not our job, Dominic. We're a solution vendor. We're not processing data. We give them a solution that allows them to process the data. So uh, think of it this way, that the data processor of uh, registered shareholders is the registrar. And in a central, central CSD, central securities depository, if it's a name on register environment, a beneficial owner level environment, the CSD is uniquely situated to be able to uh, perform the services of registrar. And, and in those countries where this is, the, this is kind of the, the central tenet of how the, the market is organized, that they are the only game in town. So Norway is a good example. So for example, in Norway, all of the assets are, are recorded in the central securities deposit in VPS. And, and they are the only central register that, that, that actually matters or is taken on. There are some exceptions, but they're small fringe, fringe companies. It's not a very, very small amount, min, minuscule. So, yeah, they are actually the data processors, not us. Okay, so if, if GDPR broadly conceived as an inhibitor for CSDs in developing a, a data business, prompts a, a larger question about how imaginative CSDs actually are anticipating new lines of new sources of revenue, new lines of business, how their role needs to, to change and what capabilities they need to develop. Do you, I mean, are, are, are CSDs stuck in a kind of utility mentality or are they so hedged about with, with regulations like GDPR, it's very difficult for them to move? What is the, what is the commercial development or business development culture of CSDs like? How good are they at imagining the future and developing their capabilities to take advantage of it? Yeah, there, but there, there are a couple of customers that, that, that main customers that they have. First of all, the, the participants are intermediaries and mo most, most of, the, the, most of the, the, the markets have intermediated in, environments. So the, the owners of the accounts are actually the participants. So the investor wants to open an account in the CSD, he goes to participant, the contract is with the participant. And that's typically how it's done. And the CSD has the unique opportunity of being able to assemble all of the separate little pools of investors over all the, uh, the, the participants into a single cohesive register and then deal with his other customer, which is the issuer. So they're, they're already doing that. And the, the sort of things that, uh, that CSDs, you know, in, in the mer merging market particularly, can, can start to work with is the financial institutions in developing the sort of things that go with a pool of assets, so pledging, stock lending and borrowing, that, that, that kind of thing. So stock lending and borrowing is not just a good idea that came out of G30. It, it actually could be a source of revenue. And if you're the registrar as well, it means that you can also process all the corporate events. 
and the, the, the levels of service that that can be taken to kind of defy the imagination. So at the moment, the, there's a board meeting at a company and, and someone's got to declare a dividend or a rights issue or whatever the corporate event it is that you're trying to run. The lawyers have got to go over it and then someone's got to approach whoever it is is the, going to be processing that. And you know, in my world, I'm hoping that that's, that's a CFD running one of our solutions. And uh, But... If you think of it, they can be given direct access as a specific kind, specialized kind of participant in the CSD with a role of issuer. And they can be responsible for submitting and, and processing their own, own corporate events, at, at least to a certain extent. There's some things that only, only the CSD can do, but uh, by and large, a, a lot of centralized things, it, it's actually much more convenient to have the issuer give the issuer capability to be able to log in and, and do as much of that themselves because you can charge for it and you re reduce the, the workload centrally within the CSD that you have, you have to deal with. So yeah, there's a lot, lots, <laughs> good distance still to go that, that uh, CSDs can exploit their position in, in terms of custodians of the data. What they can't do is sell the data to marketing agents who want to send you junk mail through the post. That they can't do. But um, they can provide issues with services ab about their own shareholders, for sure. So am I just wrong to think that CSDs are not responding aggressively to, to the opportunities of, say, the data economy? They can see the opportunities, they're acting towards it, but they are constrained, A, by their shareholders, B, by regulatory factors such as GDPR. But are they also, is there any danger they're, they're a bit complacent because they have these monopolies? Uh, people have to use them. They enjoy the protection of the central bank. I'm trying to understand how much latitude they have to behave entrepreneurially. That, that's hard to assess from, from where I'm sitting at. Um, I think I think they're not responding especially aggressively because things so far have moved quite slowly uh, in respect of uh, the sort of services that, that, they're ex that, that the CSD is expected to perform. They're not many. Huh? So it, it, settlement, running corporate actions, yes, it's a wide scope, a lot of detailed functionality, but uh, it's, it's all, let's say, if you can think of it as only dealing with, dealing with the settlement process and post-trade processing, uh, and that includes, you know, dealing with participants and giving them them services or dealing with issuers. Typically, they don't deal directly with investors at all. Uh, there are exceptions, of course. I mean, my, my, our first CSD client is Malta. Malta, Malta are very centralized. So their registry department, the, the, all, all of the, their contracts with the investors are directly with the CSD, not through intermediaries. But most of the rest of the Europe, if they're not an omnibus environment where the, that kind of work is already distributed out amongst the participants, if it's if it's not one of those environments, it's name on met register environments, then um, they're already doing quite a lot. They're not particularly aggressive because, again, there's a conflict in, in terms of the provision of those services between them and the participants. I mean, the participant is also interested in contacting the investor and selling as much to him as he can, and getting paid for it. And even if the CSD is allowed to do that, remember the CSD is owned by its participants, typically in, 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 in markets throughout the world. So if the CSD starts to say, okay, we're going to go into pledging and we're going to you know, operate some kind of in, independent service for that, uh, they're treading on directly on the toes, not just of the participants, you know, for whom they're providing a service, but their shareholders as well. It's a little bit <laughs> kind of incestuous from that perspective, but um, the CSDs have stayed away from it because they don't want to compete directly with one one highly paying and very important category of their customers. Can I ask to what extent? technology itself is in, an inhibitor of their of their flexibility. And the reason I ask you this question is that um, we interviewed Andrea Tranquilini, who was the, the former CEO of, of the failed uh, ID2S CSD. And he, he said one of the factors that made it very difficult for CSD to change was, was legacy systems. Uh, they can't accommodate 
new technologies, new ways of doing things, blockchain tokenization being the, the obvious ones. Um, now you're operating in a market where you're one of the, you're, you're one of the leading vendors of, to, to, of technology to CSDs. You're competing with the likes of, of, of TCS and NASDAQ. Um, so how is this, how is the, how is the market working in structural terms? I mean, how do you divide this market up amongst yourselves? And is the fact that, that CSDs are kind of, you know, maintaining legacy rather than looking to take a leap into an, into a new era, a new technological era factors in your ability to sell successfully to them? It's hard to say. I mean, the, the Percival suffers from the additional disadvantages that we're, we're small compared to the, the vendors who are our natural competitors in ter terms of quality. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and that's difficult. Uh, and, and there haven't been that many leaps, Dominic. And, and, and it's not as if um, blockchain and distributed ledger technologies and evolution is actually a revolution. So you're talking about dispensing with the, the central aspect of, of, of a CSD. And there's a, that C in CSD, that's about centralization. Um, blockchain is, is, is about not centralizing things. It's re replacing trust with truth, remember? So that's a complete C change. It's not, not anything like they've done before. That said, there are stages in which it, it it could be done or that they're hybrids that, that might work to that approach and that you can settle on the chain and maintain your register centrally, for example. Um, I don't know, I could brainstorm about that for half an hour, but that's not the subject of this discussion. Well, but, that, that, um, well one thing we could brainstorm about is, is tokenization because this, this grows directly out of, the, out of the blockchain technology. Now, if security tokenization did take off, if CSDs were to maintain a role in the securities markets, they would need some kind of capability to operate in that environment. Do you do you currently find yourself competing with with so-called blockchain vendors, if I might use that term? I'm thinking here of companies like Blockstation and, and GMX and indeed R3 with their quarter platform. Um, they all seem to be active in in Barbados, where you are as well. Um, yeah. Do you do you find yourselves competing with that that type yeah. of vendor? No, absolutely not, because the, the customers that they're going after are a little bit different. So uh, th there's one, one particular customer that we're talking to, I can't, can't say who it is, um, where we're talking with, with just such a vendor who, who wants to, to create, well, actually the, the stock exchange wants to have, uh, allow investors to be able to trade directly on the exchange through um, through one of these vendors. But yeah, they don't want to, that's how would I put this? They don't want to have to deal with those investors directly, okay? And, and they still want the rules of the market to be applied. So even if, you know, GMX or Blockstation, or I can't remember what else you mentioned, uh, wanted to operate there, they still have to operate under the rules of the market. The rules of that market say that all trades must be executed through a broker. So we're looking at, 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 at trying to develop something along those lines where Blockstation can still get its pound of flesh and, and relate direct to investors and deal directly with those end investors but for each one of those accounts that it creates, and I'm sure it charges for in some way, um, they have those orders have got to be rooted, and the settlement's got to be rooted through one of the existing brokers. So it's um, we're still working on it, and I, I hope to have something um, interesting to publish or release to the world in <laughs> within the next year or so. Mm -hmm. But it's still still early days yet. So we, no, we don't we don't compete with them directly. It's not as if, I mean, I personally, uh, born and grew up in Barbados, so I can talk a little bit more about that environment. And from what I can see, yes, I'm aware that those, those, those companies that you mentioned are operating in the region, but it's not, not as if people are uh, there are suddenly going to go, yeah, it's Blockstation or yeah, it's a, a, a blockchain type of technology. Let's all jump on there and start trading shares. It's not like that. And I think, I think one of the attraction, um, that those companies have for operating in the Caribbean is that they can they can list there 
but that the tokens that they're listing are not necessarily local tokens. They might local in the sense that they're issued in Barbados or Trinidad or, or you know the Eastern Caribbean or wherever it happens to be, uh, because that those countries are are actively trying to attract that kind of business because it's good for them and good for the economy generally. But it not they are not competing directly with the existing uh, market participants that I can see that I'm aware of. I, I can be wrong, of course, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of any kind of direct conflict between those um, yeah. blockchain style uh, uh, you know, solution vendors and the existing capital market uh, infrastructure in any way. I think the orthodox solution to any CSD or a lot of CSDs are owned by exchanges. So to any exchange group felt threatened by tokenization, we to build up a, a blockchain based or digital tokenized security exchange alongside your existing exchanges. It's the approach taken by the, the Swiss stock exchange, for example. I wonder how difficult or easy that would be for a, a CSD to do. Could you build up a, a security token CSD alongside your existing CSD easily? Yeah, we could add a chain to our existing solution if it was wanted. We could just add a chain to it. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be quite within the, the spirit of the thing, but it would 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 meet and look to the outside world as if it were a chain, and it would in fact be a chain. And but there would be some pretty slick <laughs> centralized technology sitting under it. In any case, th those guys are not going to have an open node network. They're still going to want control of the nodes. Because you know the distributed ledger technology it relies on on the truth being the truth is actually voted on and there are algorithms that, that, that do that and that they will only want authorized uh, nodes in there so that it's not going to look like Bitcoin or anything like that and I think that people popularly tend to think that that's how it's going to look but it'll still the control of it will still be centralized and yes of course you could do that Dominic and it's one of the things we actually discuss with potential customers when we start talking about this subject. I, I, I propose exactly the same thing. Well, hey, look, you could build some kind of uh, token add-on to the existing you know, tokenized add-on, digitized add-on that, that, that was based on distributed ledger technology that was you know, in, integrated at the very you know, muscle and bone core level with, with the existing solution. We could do it, but... Well, so we can't do it for free, Dominic. And it's the, the costs are for uh, exchanges that are counting their pennies. The costs are significant. Mm -hmm. Right. So they'd have the costs of dual running both the, the new platform and the old, and they wouldn't necessarily have that much business on the on the new platform. No. But if they are dealing with issuers and with investors who want to go down that digital asset path. Um, and maybe some of those investors want to want to stray outside the private permission networks, the type you've described, and actually start investing in cryptocurrencies or NFTs, some of these public open networks. So you're going to end up with a system of networks of networks, and you yeah. as their, they're going to turn to you as their vendor, saying, "Well, we need to interoperate across traditional networks, digital yeah. networks, and indeed." private digital networks and public digital networks. So we're evolving towards this world of greater fragmentation and complexity and both type, both sets of users they have, by which I mean the investors issuers are going to be quite, quite keen for that interaction to be seamless, aren't they? Dominic, you should come and work for me. You have a much better <laughs> sales pitch than I do. I've been giving exactly the same message to my customers. Why, you know, it's not, you don't necessarily need a chain. You need to be able to interoperate with how many other chains and networks there are out there. And that, that, that's a much easier and, and more economic solution or, or, or patch to apply to, uh, you know, one of those dinosaur CSDs <laughs> you like to refer to. Them. But I'm just kidding. But you, you know what I mean? It's just, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a legacy system that, that's difficult to adapt, um, integrate it. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. We, ours is our system is actually quite easy to adapt and in, integrate, so it wouldn't be a problem to us. But I, I can't claim for myself any special position with that. Even 
even quite primitive systems could, can still be integrated. You could put some kind of portal or, or in, in interactive bit of software, glue software between there in order to do it. I mean, the fashion these days is to integrate through, well, the recommendation is to integrate through standard messaging, mm -hmm. which in the CSD world and, 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 and post-trade world is either fix or, or, or swift, swift message type to either 15 or 22 or the much preferred 20 or 22 these days. Well, in terms of tokenization so far, we've talked largely about established exchanges and CSDs who are facing a potential challenge from that area. Mm -hmm. Among the challenges they face are these are these startup um, tokenized security token platforms, and yeah. I'll draw your attention to one, which is which is Archax, which is a, a security token platform started in London. They are now building or encouraging to be built a digital asset CSD called Montes Digital. And the reason they're doing that is they would like to, they, they have to use a CSD under, under European regulation, but they, they that's one reason, but maybe they also see opportunities here. But the real reason they had to build their own, as it were, is because they couldn't find a partner among existing CSDs. I was a bit surprised by that. Are you surprised that no CSD wanted to work with them? Um, am I surprised? No, I'm not surprised. And it's not because they couldn't work with them. And, you know, that smells like politics to me, Dominic. <laughs> not, not any technical hurdle. That yeah. smells more like politics and, and um, the, old, the old guard closing ranks rather than an inability to be able to do business with them. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about a, a, a battle, a war being raged between the powers that be and the powers that want to be. Mm -hmm. There's no other way to describe it. So. It's a yeah, pure case. Okay. So pure they're case just of... closing ranks and shutting them out. That's what that, that's would be my reading of it. Sorry, Dominic. Yeah. Okay. No, you're right. I think the the incumbents are shutting out the challengers, yeah. uh, which was part of the problem which ID two S had. Why would you help your um, uh, nem your nemesis come into existence? I mean, yeah. <laughs> but that's precisely where the regulators should step in and start to encourage changes in behaviour. I suppose. Now, what what do you? Let's assume tokenization does evolve at whatever speed and maybe it speed starts to speed up how do you, how do you expect or how would you advise csds to evolve their their business model we've touched upon um the difficulties they have with data for example and being a data manager is one thing they could do but what, what are your thoughts about how csds should change to take account of the tokenization of securities what should they do differently well, first of all, they're already a data manager. There's no doubt about that. But um, the, thing, the same topic that we just finished discussing, which, which is to be interoperable. So, and, and that's all the customer wants. He doesn't care about the damn plumbing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he makes a deal and he wants, wants it to go through and, and, and realize the profits or, or sit on top of his, his pile of, of tokens and wonder when they're going to go up in value, whichever side of the coin they happen to be. Um, he just wants everything to work. And there's no technical reason why they couldn't do that. It's just a lot, lot to be done. And I think one of the things that the proponents of uh, digitization, tokenization should, should examine is standardization. I can't begin to describe the benefits of standardization or that standardization as a process has brought over the, the three, three and a little bit decades of my career. It's just phenomenal because once you have a standard approach to interfacing and, and, and the, the storage of data, and I'm not talking about whether it's on a digital exchange or, or, or whether a distri distributed ledger or what, whether it's in a centralized uh, database I'm talking about, the way in which these systems instruct each other and the sort of data sets that get transferred between them, the requirements at that, that kind of level. If, if, if they paid more attention to that and had some kind of genuine standard that would allow multiple chains to be able to interact with each other, some, something that people could work to, mm -hmm. the, wor the world would open up for them. It really would. Mm -hmm. And you think that standardization would start to expose CSDs, would kind of force them to change because the, the greater interoperability would bring new types of assets, new types of investors, 
new types of issuers to bear who would want to be doing things not in the old way? But no, not just that. I mean, the CSDs have had to cope, to cope with uh, changes in standards. It's it's continually changing, but at least as one moving target that you're looking for. We, you know, we we mushed along for you know 20, 30 years with, with, with the, the fifteen or twenty two messaging. And then out came 2022, and you know it, it, it's still they're they're still in the process of, of changing over to that. So D2S was was kind of instrumental, at least getting the post trade side of that work working on, on 2022. But a lot of a lot of participants within Europe are still still exchanging 15 or 22 messages. So it, it, it's it, it's a, a quicker process if there's one standard to work through. If a CSD is faced with trying to, to have to be interoperable with, at the moment, I don't know, let's say 10 credible distributed uh, chains, that, why? <laughs> I, I no. want one. I want one way of being able to interact with those things, not, not 10 different ones. And that, that's a conservative estimate. And if this thing takes off without standardization, 10 may grow to 100. I mean, as a CSD, you go like, what the hell? No, we can't keep up with this. And as a result, you don't get that kind of um, sort of impulse to the change that, that the proponents are actually expecting. You need, you need standardization to be able to, to, to allow interoperability because no one's dreaming that, that suddenly, you know, a light will come from the sky and we go, oh, now we see we're mistaken. Let's get rid of all this crap and have digitized exchanges everywhere. It's not going to work like that. So even, even if you think this is going to be really, really successful and that's the way of the future, there will be a long period of time, probably a, somewhere between a quarter and a half a century where you're going to have to coexist globally with uh, classical exchange technology. It, it, so it, you need a standard, and there isn't one at the moment. That, that's sorely needed. Well, that brings me to my final question for you, uh, Chris. And what you just said about ISO 15022 and ISO 2022 is quite a good segue into it, because yeah. the securities industry or security services industry as a whole has made pretty clear it's not going to switch from 15022 to 2022. It thinks it's doing fine with the 1502 standard. They achieved 99% settlement success rates with it. They see no reason to make an investment to move towards this richer, uh, more flexible uh, format for the so-called data economy moving forward, at least not in the short term. Now, we had um, we had Nadine Shakar, who's head of digital at State Street, um, on, on a webinar uh, a few months ago. And one of the things she said, uh, and very much she's working for State Street, a, a global custodian bank, which is among those who are not pressing to move to, to the new standard which you attach such enormous importance to but one of the things she said on that um on that webinar was that in in a way csds and she was referring to other financial market infrastructures as well but including csds they need to disrupt themselves or risk getting left behind because this digital asset revolution is underway whether we whether we like it or not do you think that she is right to advise CSDs to get on with disrupting themselves before they get disrupted by th some third party or not? Or do you think that perhaps they're doing it and we're just not aware of it? I think they're doing a lot, what they can and what they can afford. Um, the, the, the situation at the moment, as I said, is not, not clear in, in, in you know, where you're going to go for because everything is just, with the arrival of each new um, proponent or ne each new startup, in, in in this area it just muddies the water without the standard it, it, that, that's not going to get clearer so yeah csds would like to do something classical exchanges would like to do something and uh, whether she was right or not to to advise them i think that advice you could apply that advi advice in any era any century not just it's not just for the now i mean we should always be trying to, you know, look at what we're doing and, and look at ways of, of, of improving it. I mean, it, it's the way we approach things. We, we don't wait, usually wait for a funded project to, to redevelop. If there are substantial changes that, and, and we think that this new platform is, it will allow us to develop a much better CSD product, we start again. 
and we develop a new one and we offer all of our existing clients a migration path from the old old to the new. So I think this this current version of CSD that we're shipping is probably the eighth one that we've written. So it's not, not just the markets. The vendors have got to do the same thing, disrupt themselves. It's not, not easy. And remember, we're, we're a small company. So, and I don't mean that as, as a disadvantage. I'm putting it forward as an advantage. It's, it's um, you want a good complex product, you put a small team on it. And, and you give them agency, you let them go ahead. Creative people need agency. So you let them go ahead and, and, and design what they think is best. What, what you don't do is throw, throw 150 developers at it and four architects and six product owners. It's just, that that's just crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, she was right. But she, was, she would have been right 100 years ago and 100 years from now, that advice would still be sound. She's, she's, she's right at all times and in all places. And the way to change effectively is to do it all the time and use small teams to do it and for all stakeholders yeah it, it doesn't matter what role you play you you really should re-examine your position in the market you know whatever it is you're doing look at it try and perfect it and if, if perfecting it means like let's do that bit over it's worth trying chris richardson thanks very much for taking the time